and I am going to um, I'm going to share my screen uh, just so I can uh, talk to a few slides here. Um, hope everyone can see that research project um, that and I'll, uh, I'll give you a little bit of history and what we're doing now uh, and then I want to leave some time uh, in case people want to talk about anything uh, uh, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly and some of the some of the slides I'll probably move through um, without too much ado uh, I also want to acknowledge that uh, Chloe Cameron is here, who is a part of this project. She's really, uh, she's a PhD student at Ivy and is doing a lot of project management on this. Um, but let me, um, let me just kind of walk through, uh, this is the slide I'll probably spend the most time on. Uh, this is, um, this is a, a brief history of the project. And I'd have to say that the origins of this project were a bit accidental. Uh, I was in, uh, Copenhagen, Denmark at Copenhagen Business School on what was, uh, we didn't call it this at Harvard Business School, but it was basically a sabbatical and um, uh, had the opportunity to meet someone named Torkel Sona, who we'll all meet later uh, in about 25 minutes. Uh, and you, some of you will know this story. In 2004, Torkel founded a firm called Specialist Darna. Uh, in Danish, that means the specialists. Uh, and uh, they did mostly software testing. Uh, I was very interested in this company. I was actually there studying creative industries, the design industry specifically, uh, but I got kind of sidetracked on, on this because I found it so interesting. And I, Jonathan Wareham, who some of you may know, he was a, a dean at ASADA. He's currently a professor there and one of his students, uh, we worked on a case, a Harvard Business School case, called Specialist Sterna Sense and Details. Uh, and we also uh, put together uh, in this uh, project, we put together a couple of uh, journal articles for a journal published by M MIT called MIT Innovations, which is kind of a social enterprise focused um, journal. And I stayed in touch with Torkel and his company. Uh, and uh, in 2012, worked with the Harvard Business Review uh, they were doing these little insight videos. Uh, you know, each little video was a um, a nugget of uh, of wisdom for practicing managers, and so we did one called "Don't Leave Talent on the Table," uh, and the gist of that was just to say there's talent out there that the world needs, and uh, we should work hard to try to figure out how to access it and activate it. Uh, that, you know, there's if both for reasons of creating opportunities so people can have uh, more fulfilling lives, but also uh, quite simply, as we often put it, the world needs all the talent it can get. Um, so uh, that was, that got a bit of attention in 2014, uh, by then, large companies were starting to engage in these kinds of programs. Uh, companies like SAP, SAP was the first major company to establish a neurodiversity employment program in 2013. And we'll also hear at 8.30 from one of the, the really the key guy uh, on that program. He'll be joining us in a few minutes. Um, but, you know, SAP, uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Microsoft and so forth, uh, and uh, Torkel Sona and I wrote a piece for the MIT Sloan Management Review about what was going on. Uh, we called it Redesigning Work for the Innovation Economy. Uh, and, uh, the, the title was The Dandelion Principle, and this is a metaphor that, a, a very elegant and poetic metaphor that Torkel has long used uh, at Specialist Sterna, where he describes the dandelion and how many people work very hard to eradicate dandelions from their green lawns. But what Torkel likes to point out is that the, um, the dandelion is actually a very valuable plant. The problem with the dandelion is not that it's not inherently valuable. It's that uh, we, it's, it's in a, a, a lawn that's supposed to be uh, uniformly green. And so he flips the thing around and says, maybe the problem is the idea that the lawn should be uniformly green. Uh, and he equates that to his talented uh, autistic, largely autistic staff 
who, um, you know, are kind of forced into organization charts, roles on organization charts, ask the question, what would happen if we flipped it around and recognize their inherent value and tried to activate their talent by building a context in which they could be effective around them. Um, anyway, um, that article uh, was published in 2014, and then we produced a series of cases working with Gary Pisano uh, at HBS. So the first one in 2015 was SAP Autism at Work. Uh, we proceeded uh, after that to do one on Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, that company has since restructured and uh, the part of the company that still has the program is now called DXC Technologies, but it's still an active and thriving program. Uh, in 2017, uh, we summarized a lot of what we were seeing in a Harvard Business Review article uh, called Neurodiversity as a Competitive Advantage, uh, profiled some of the programs that were active here. And you'll see in a minute some of the original companies that were involved, but they were these, some of these, SAP, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Microsoft, EY, JP, uh, JP Morgan Chase. Uh, these companies now today have uh, large programs, programs with hundreds of people in them. Uh, and then we also, uh, in 2018, we began to look at a, what we call dip, dipping deeper into the spectrum, meaning uh, that there's a much larger group of people who need opportunity and deserve opportunity who aren't data scientists or aren't software developers uh, and are not likely, uh, you know, don't have those skill sets and yet, uh, you know, how can we activate talent at other levels than, um, you know, these very high skill level jobs? Uh, and so uh, Hart Chapter and Marx was about um, uh, neurodivergent uh, workers in uh, a factory setting doing uh, jobs like box maker and um, inventory counter and things like that. So, and that has been a major thrust, as you'll see, uh, of our project is to try to understand some of the ways that uh, many companies, often small companies, are doing work that's related to activating the talents of a much broader set of people than people who are highly educated and highly skilled. Uh, and uh, Moish Tov, who will join us at 830, has a company called Joydu that's really at the forefront of that. So that's what he's about. He's about uh, how can we um, enact, activate talent uh, with people who, um, you know, who don't miss, well, they may have very high skill levels, but they may also have some uh, more serious uh, impacts from, from their conditions. Um, we've also written a case on EY, uh, that is in press. Uh, and then the big thing that really uh, turned this from a, um, a sort of a, an ad hoc project into a more serious one was when uh, SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council in Canada awarded us uh, a grant. Um, to pursue the project more formally in 2020. And uh, that's don't leave talent on the table, discerning best practice and neurodiversity employment. And this has allowed us to uh, move into, you know, actually having uh, graduate students um, on the project, which is of course a, a great key to getting a lot of good stuff done. Uh, the purpose of the project as we like to express it, we want to discern best practices in neurodiversity employment, understand the reasons why programs are different across different contexts. And we also want to disseminate this knowledge in a way that's going to allow it to enter business school curriculums and uh, you know, uh, the uh, normal mainstream of practicing management. Um, we are also, we have some broader theoretical aims as well. Um, uh, you know, aims around theorizing how experience with these programs might provide insights into how to manage talents and capabilities of, uh, of all employees, not just people in these programs, uh, especially, um, and uh, the, the backdrop is, is it, is, is there the basic question that we like to think about is uh, a, as competition shifts from efficiency-based and economies of scale-based more in the direction of innovation, uh, does that shift the balance uh, towards more management of individuals, uh, less standardized roles, uh, you know, so can we move away from that static org chart 
in the direction of um, you know realizing a sort of more individually uh, oriented style of management that activates talent to a greater degree. Um, one thing that we always like to point out is that we are a business school. Uh, there are a great many uh, interesting and, and excellent organizations in the world that are doing research uh, on uh, autism and other neurodivergent conditions that are not taking the same tack. So m much of it, and some, a lot of it has been clinical psychology based, uh, but there is also uh, disability studies. And uh, so for example, Cornell has a, a very uh, prominent project that is more uh, sort of disability studies and disability policy based. We're very clear to point out that we're not clinicians, we're not experts in things like autism, uh, nor are we necessarily experts in disability laws or policies. Uh, we see our contribution as lying uh, within the possibility of normalizing and professionalizing neurodiversity employment uh, with management practices and justified in the ways that companies justify things. So almost all of the programs we've studied, uh, the companies justify the programs in uh, cost benefit terms and uh, very, very practical benefits that they see coming from the program. I'm going to go through these quickly. These are the, the six original roundtable companies. As I said, most of these companies now have more than 100 people. EY, I believe, is the largest now with over 300 people in their program. Uh, but JP Morgan Chase and Microsoft and uh, uh, SAP also, also have uh, hundreds. Uh, this is also expanded. These are other companies that have since joined the roundtable. And uh, here are some more companies. This is from a summit that was uh, the year before the pandemic hit 2019. And these were companies who were getting underway with neurodiversity employment programs. And so uh, by now, these companies would be two or three years in, uh, of course, uh, making allowances for the pandemic, which has slowed everything down for for a lot of companies, but some of these companies I know to be further along now. Uh, some of the early things that have been revealed in uh, kind of large scale or macro level benefits, uh, companies report jobs filled in areas of skill shortage that would have gone unfilled. Uh, they also report that when they're hiring people that into many of these positions from broader talent pools, they're accessing higher levels of talent than when they would have been able to access via conventional hiring approaches. So some of the people they're hiring are really, really good, uh, despite the fact that they don't interview well, right? And have often, in many cases, they've hired people who've been un unemployed for a long period of time into very uh, productive, um, high skill level uh, positions where they've done very well. Uh, there are, of course, this is probably the most obvious benefit that companies might experience market uh, marketing benefits, reputational benefits from favorable perceptions of firm activities. Uh, interestingly, this also shows up internally that people um, within a firm find their work more meaningful in the proximity of these kinds of programs and SAP in particular has employee engagement data that shows that anybody anywhere close to these programs, employee engagement kicks up uh, a good notch. Um, well, here we go, that one. Uh, morale, meaningful work that improves uh, productivity and employment of work. Uh, there's also a lot of evidence coming out that these programs uh, are allowing companies to innovate better by providing uh, potentially valuable ideas and points of views and ways of thinking that wouldn't otherwise be accessible. Um, and there's some very concrete examples of millions and millions of dollars saved or uh, or, or value created of that amount um, out of these programs. Uh, another one is uh, another mode of improvement is uh, process improvements that arise from enhanced abilities and inclinations of neurodivergent employees to spot and call out uh, irregularities and inefficiencies. So. Uh, we are also finding uh, one of the most interesting things, I think, in what we're seeing is what we call spillover benefits that we're discovering and companies are discovering that when they design uh, features or supports for programs like these, they actually end up creating things that work better for all of their employees. And one finding that we've seen almost everywhere that we've been uh, is 
uh, every every company kind of independently reports that managing in these programs makes uh, makes people a better manager of all their employees because this ad- attitude of how can I create the conditions in which my employees can maximize their contribution and their value, that's actually a pretty good way to think about uh, all of your employees. Uh, so it changes kind of habits of supervision uh, that many people um, are experiencing. Uh, There are some challenges and maybe we'll get a chance to talk to some of the practitioners about some of those. Uh, Some of the ones that come up a lot is it's, uh, you know, the way Torkel puts it is many years ago, he never dreamed he would have a supply problem. He always thought it would be a demand problem trying to convince people they should hire neurodivergent talent. But the reality is there's now a a supply problem. So uh, trying to find people for these programs that, because there's actually a fair amount of competition for them now from corporates. Um, And so um, unfortunately, you don't just go to a business school or any other computer science school and say, we want to talk to your neurodivergent talent. They don't really know who they are. And so uh, there there's a lot of fairly ad hoc networking based ways of accessing talent. Another thing that is has been a limitation in places is that these programs typically requires local support from third parties and the local support has been very local it doesn't uh, it doesn't generalize or um, it doesn't um, uh, you know multinationals are much better at transferring their knowledge across geographic boundaries than uh, social partners, which are very, tend to be very locally focused. So um, that uh, that results in variation in the support available in different regions. Uh, so every 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 geographic region is a place where we have to refigure things out, right? Um, yeah. So you have to return to zero on the development of support networks. Uh, there is, and this is I mentioned this before. This is a big focus of our project now to look at. Is there a way of broadening the impact, right? Because as as credible as, as commendable as these programs are, we're still talking only hundreds or thousands of people. Uh, and when uh, we estimate, and this is a white paper that Chloe wrote, uh, Chloe Cameron, our PhD student who's here on the call, suggests be uh, you know she she pulled data from a lot of different places and tried to come up with an estimate of how many people in the world we might reasonably conclude f- could be categorized as neurodivergent and uh, the number is somewhere between 800 million and 2 billion worldwide um, and so uh, the question is you know can we dip deeper into the pool of the neuro 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 minorities talents uh, and here's a few examples. I'm just going to go through these really quickly, but uh, these are companies. I talked earlier about companies, and we'll hear from one in a few minutes, Joy Do at Moish Tov, uh, companies that are figuring out how to activate the talents of people at kind of all skill levels. And so this is a network of car washes uh, that's located in Florida. Uh, and you can see, I mean, some of the things you can see there, you can see color coding, you can see various kind of workflow um and uh metrics that people are figuring out around these to help uh the light the, the word i always use is to help activate the talent uh this is heart shafter and marks which i mentioned before and you can see there's a lot of making visual uh again color coding and um you know uh work there are some uh, some work products here so things like on the far right that are aimed at helping people kind of manage their anxieties and so forth. And as I say, turns out some of these things work pretty well for all of the the employees. Um, And here's another one, Spectrum Designs is a company in New York. Uh, It's a nonprofit that uh, they do a couple things. They do, they're they're a bakery company, uh, but they also are a t-shirt company. Uh, And so they have companies or they have uh, employees working at multiple skill levels uh, and uh, are doing all these, um, creating these work products. So a lot of what we uh, think about this under is the the heading of universal design, right? How can we design things that work for people at multiple skill levels? Uh, Last thing I'll mention is our advisory board. Uh, We we do have an advisory board. 
We want to make sure that our project is guided by voices from the neurodivergent community. There is a, um, a strong imperative within this community, especially among self-advocates. One of the things they like to say is nothing about us without us. Uh, meaning that uh, everything needs to include the the affected uh, constituencies uh, and their their preferences and decisions. Um, we uh, we we may have members of our research team at any given time who identify a, as neurodivergent, and we indeed have. But uh, there's nothing we recognize in in the inherent practice of of uh, our research process that assures that. And so we've created an advisory board that is our attempt to address this in a systematic way. And so we have uh, six people on our advisory board. Um, and um, you can see, I won't, I won't go into their bios in detail, but for example, Rachel is, uh, she is a QA uh, supervisor at a company called Aspiritech that does neurodiversity um, in the IT industry, neurodiversity employment in the IT industry. Some of you may know the name of Dr. Temple Grandin, uh, who uh, has done a great many, had made a great many contributions to understanding the autistic mind and also to uh, to areas of um, taking care of animals, uh, animal behavior. Uh, Autumn O'Connor, based in Australia, is uh, very involved in helping neurodivergent populations uh, become ready for um, for employment in their best possible way. She's also an advocate. She's a leader of ASPE Rebels, Rebels, um, and um, and then we also uh, have uh, Sh Stu Shader, who has very been very involved in the program in the early days at Microsoft. Uh, Dave Thompson uh, is a self advocate um, with the AEDHD dyslexia community. Uh, who works with Spectrum Designs in New York. And Charlotte Velour is um, a very experienced uh, board member uh, based in the UK. Um, she's also been an, an investment banker uh, for much of her life. Um, and so has uh, achieved greatly, partly by leveraging, uh, she would say, I believe her, uh, her autistic capabilities. So um, has really turned things into a strength. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. Obviously, it's an eye chart, but uh, it's just kind of a list of some of the things that we've produced uh, and published since uh, we got started. And I will stop there and um, unshare my screen and see if anybody wants to talk about anything or ask anything. And I expect we'll be joined.